World leaders are keeping a close eye on North Korea after the country claims that it carried out a new long-range missile test. Uh, Deborah Pata is in Johannesburg following this story and some of the other top headlines from around the globe. Deborah, good morning. Good morning, Anne-Marie. Well, beginning with that North Korean story, the country's Academy of Defense Science claims it successfully test-fired those missiles over the weekend and that the weapons had been in development for two years. The government said that the weapons helped guarantee the security of the state and help contain hostile forces against North Korea. Both the U.S. and neighboring South Korea are looking into the launch claims. This latest event comes as South Korea's top nuclear envoy heads to Japan to discuss North Korea with U.S. and Japanese officials, and that takes place over the next two days. And staying with security concerns, Iran and the International Atomic Energy agency have reached a last-minute deal. This means that Iran will avoid being censured for violating agreements with the nuclear agency. The new Iranian government has agreed to let the organization reset monitoring devices that help measure the progress of the country's nuclear program. The deal was considered a minimal requirement for the resumption of talks in Vienna on trying to restore compliance with the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, which of course, as you know, was abandoned by former President Donald Trump three years ago. Over to Slovakia, where Pope Francis has delivered a strong speech urging the country to be open to migrants. He told Slovakian authorities to take special care of the vulnerable and said no one should suffer discrimination. This followed a similar theme in Hungary on Sunday, where after meeting privately with far-right Prime Minister Viktor Orban, Francis held an outdoor mass in front of tens of thousands of people and called on the country to extend its arms to everyone. The Pope's remarks amounted to a diplomatic but clear criticism of Hungary's anti-migrant policies under Orban, who has called migration a poison. And finally, to the island nation of Madagascar, where four years of drought has pushed the country to the brink of one of the world's first famines caused by climate change. The country has long been prone to extreme weather, either droughts or floods, but this time round, at least 30,000 people are facing devastating starvation. Many have been forced to eat locusts, wild leaves and cactus fruits to survive. The situation is so dire, it's now regarded as a level five emergency by the UN's World Food Program, which is the highest level of food insecurity. And the WFP fears those figures could rise dramatically. More than 1.1 million people are experiencing some form of severe food shortage and require urgent assistance. The drought has also led to agricultural losses of up to 60%. Anne-Marie? Deborah, tell me more about what's going on in, in Madagascar. How has the drought and climate crisis escalated to this dire catastrophic point there? That's an important question, Anne-Marie. As always, with this kind of calamity, there's been a deadly confluence of, of several different crises. The UN has specifically emphasized climate change, and as the head of its World Food Program noted, Madagascar has contributed nothing, absolutely nothing, to climate change. It is not a global offender, mm. and yet, unfairly, they are paying the highest price of any other country in the world. Think of Madagascar really as the canary in the coal mine. It is sounding the alarm for the rest of the world. This island nation is at the receiving end of human-made climate change, which has resulted in erratic rains, either too much or none at all. And of late, those rains have been even less regular. And the price of staple foods like rice, for example, is soaring. But there are other factors. The global COVID pandemic has hammered the country's economy. And in a bid to protect itself, the island has really just shut itself off from the outside world. So all those tourists who used to trek through the rainforest to see those wonderful lemurs are no longer visiting. And that means that the 1.5 million people who depend on them have lost their livelihoods. Critics also point out that this should be a wake-up call for Madagascar's government. If successive regimes had not really, as it were, mismanaged the economy for so long, the country would be prosperous enough to deal with these kind of shocks. I mean, look, for example, at uh, neighboring Mauritius. It's also been hit by extreme weather. Its economy devastated by COVID. But because the country is a lot wealthier, 
people are not starving. Anne-Marie? Mm, um, so, Deborah, why is it Madagascar receiving more human, humanitarian aid? We're talking about a small country. Um, I would think that if there was an intense humanitarian focus, a huge difference could be made. Well, that's really what needs to happen in the long term and the short term. Madagascar's lean season starts this month. More than half a million children under the age of five are at risk of being acutely malnourished. And without immediate short-term aid, many children will grow up with stunted bodies, stunted minds. So the country needs donor aid urgently. But long term, it's a much harder problem to solve. Madagascar needs to really heed that wake-up call we spoke about, the call to govern better and develop the country's infrastructure. I mean, look at agriculture. It's barely mechanized in Madagascar. Only 15% of Malagasy people have electricity. When we visited there just before the pandemic, long power outages literally happened every single day. And globally, I think this is really an important long-term solution. Our awareness around climate change needs to incorporate, I think, Anne-Marie, an understanding that we have to do all we can to prevent our warming planet from getting hotter because the repercussions aren't always immediately around us. We don't see them, but they occur with devastating consequences halfway around the world. Anne-Marie? Yeah, it's a very important reminder, Deborah. Thank you so much.